Welcome. My name is Stefan Achenbach. I'm the president-elect of the European Society of Cardiology. It is March 23rd, 2020, and we are facing the COVID-19 pandemic. Some areas of the world are affected more than others, but my hospital, your hospital, could be in the middle of the next cluster. And we all want to get ourselves prepared, and having first-hand information is key. At the European Society of Cardiology, we are very fortunate to be able to connect to experts in those European areas affected most severely and to relay that information to you. Respiratory failure is the hallmark of COVID-19. And today we want to address some questions on the presentation and clinical course of patients who develop respiratory failure. We have asked these questions to cardiologists in Italy and Spain, to Maralena Letino and Marco Metra from Italy, to Pepe Zamorano and Hector Bueno from Spain. And I'm very lucky to have with me here on this uh, video recording Pepe Zamorano from Madrid, who will share the most important points and the most important answers to the questions we want to ask with us. Pepe, thank you very much for being here. Thank you, Stefan. So let's address the first question right away. We all think about COVID-19 as a disease of severe respiratory failure. And the question is in those patients who deteriorate and who need invasive ventilation, what is the typical timeline of events? For example, do these patients usually need to be intubated in the emergency room or is there typically some time? Well, uh, I think, Stefan, that we need to be clear on this. Sometimes, yes, but usually not. This is not the case for most of the patients. So the patient usually comes and enters in the emergency department, in the emergency room, with fever and pneumonia, Koch. This is the main symptoms. Lighter symptoms may be uh, uh, diarrhea or like a flu-like uh, uh, symptom. I think that is no need in most of the cases to intubate in the emergency room. But be aware that in few hours, the patients may deteriorate, and then you need to take care immediately. Well, thank you, Pepe. So patients will typically go to a normal ward first. And the next question is, you know, approximately, if you want to get our hospitals ready, how much time do patients typically spend on these normal wards, very roughly, before they might become respiratory, you know, compromised, worse, they need to go to the ICU? Well, it, it may vary. So mainly what we are doing in the hospitals, we have a special location in the emergency room for those patients and the COVID patients are transferred to the COVID area in the hospital. Now the hospital is almost a COVID hospital. We have like 800 patients admitted and the ICUs. So typically in the ward, they stay a few days. So maybe like a week, 10 days. Yeah, but it depends in the different patients. There are patients that they have a more risky situation like elderly patients or with comorbidities. Those patients we need to take care because they may deteriorate, immediately transfer to the ICU. But I will say that we cannot establish a fixed time for being in the world. It depends from patient to patient. From patient to patient. So, but we, we have to be aware that it's not all about creating ventilator beds. It's also a lot about creating beds that can accommodate patients who are not as sick that they don't have to go to the ICU. Exactly, exactly. In fact, there are few patients in the, in the emergency department that stay there, and there are very few patients in the ICU. Most of the patients stay on the ward, and most of the patients are discharged from the ward home. Now, about those patients who deteriorate, are there any parameters that will predict particularly rapid deterioration, those patients that we have to pay specific attention to? Well, I think that it's nothing really reliable, but no doubt that older age, older people and people and patients with comorbidities, they are extremely at high risk. They really die much more frequently than the others. And uh, we, should, we should consider that X-ray it does not really correlate well with the symptoms and with the status of the patient. So yeah, you're showing an impressive example on that slide. Yeah, exactly. I mean, this is a patient from us you know, from yesterday, and uh, he was not so bad. I mean, when I saw the, the x-ray, I said, wow, well, here we need to run immediately what's going on with this patient. But the patient was not so bad. So 
those patients for sure may deteriorate rapidly, but mainly you need to closely monitor the oxygen saturation. And this is something that you can immediately see a really drop of the saturation, and then you need to transfer those patients to the ICU. That's in fact what all the experts we asked have pointed out that very hard to predict the clinical course and the oxygen saturation seems to be a very, very important parameter to monitor in our patients. The next question is, we have pointed out that this is not just a disease of severe respiratory failure, that many patients will be, need to be treated on normal wards. What is the approximate ratio for each patient who needs intensive care and ventilation? Approximately how many patients do we have to plan for who will need to be hospitalized but without ICU and ventilatory care? Yes, Stefan, I think this is an extremely important question because we need to plan in advance. And uh, I will say that roughly between 10 and 20% require ventilation, but this really depends because don't forget that your ICUs will be saturated. You will have thousands of patients. I mean, we do have thousands of patients in Madrid. Our hospital is now a, a, a COVID hospital. All the ICUs are crowded. We are even thinking in uh, putting the patients that require ventilation in the operating rooms because we don't have enough space to ventilate the patients. And why do you see that in Italy or Spain, we have an increased mortality in the last days, last week? It's not because the virus is, uh, the infection is worse is because we cannot intubate or we cannot ventilate many patients. So you need to be prepared of that. But if you plan, um, as I said before, you know, what is the approximate ratio, um, provided you have capacities, of those who need normal ward care and those who you think might need to go to ICU? Is it 50% who need to go to the ICU? Is it 80% or is it a lot less? No, I think it's a lot less. It's a lot less. Most of the patients, as, as I said before, really can be stabilized in the ward and discharged from the ward. I think that uh, 20% is a good number. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It depends on the hospital situation. Well, thanks a lot, Pepe. And there's a final question also about your experience. You know, how do these patients arrive in the hospital? How do they come to the emergency room? Do they typically present, present themselves? Do they come by ambulance or does this change as the COVID pandemic is or the cluster is increasing in numbers in a given region? Yeah, I think that both situations uh, uh, are really the ones that you see. But now what we are doing and what we did from the beginning in Spain is try to stay at home if you don't have symptoms, that means fever and cough. So if you have that fever and cough, then come to the hospital. If not, it's much better to stay at home and then be isolated there, and then continuous monitor with your doctor. We have a special phone numbers. Well, the patients may come by themselves, this is true, but now you will see that, for example, Madrid is closed, and then the public, there are public restrictions that increase, and therefore the ambulance are bringing more frequently our, the patients to the hospital. Yeah, that's what we heard from all of the experts, that as the pandemic, as the cluster grows, more and more patients will come late especially as they can't leave their homes and will be brought by the ambulance. So, Pepe, thank you very, very much for sharing these important insights with us. I think they're extremely useful, especially for those hospitals and those healthcare systems that are trying to get themselves ready for a potentially massive increase in patient numbers. Pepe, thank you very much. Is there any other thing that you would like to share with us at this point in time? Well, I think that the world will not be the same post-COVID, but here we have seen solidarity, solidarity among doctors, solidarity, in fact, of the group of people, the team that are working with those patients, volunteers to go to the first row, and uh, solidarity from many others. We have received uh, tons of uh, donations, and I think that this is something that makes us much better. And that's a very positive signal in the middle of all of these difficulties we are facing. Pepe, thank you very much once again for sharing this information. I would also like to thank the other experts who have contributed to this collection of information, Hector Bueno, also from Madrid in Spain, Madalena Letino and Marco Metra. And I would also like to remind you that you can find many more resources on COVID-19, a series of videos, written resources, documents, uh, and links to external resources at www.scardio.org. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you.